It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Changemakers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Joining me today is Greg Braden, a five-time New York Times best-selling author, researcher, educator, lecturer, and internationally renowned pioneer in bridging modern science, ancient wisdom, and human potential. Greg merges science and the wisdom of our past to reveal solutions to the issues that challenge our lives. His research has led to 12 award-winning books now published in over 40 languages. Greg has presented his discoveries around the world, and he's been invited to speak to the United Nations, Fortune 5 your companies and the U.S. military. Welcome, Greg. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Joan. Thank you so much for having me back. And I am absolutely thrilled to have this conversation today because because the last time we spoke was five years ago and so much has happened in five years. <laughs> well, I'm so happy that you've come back on the show because your work, Greg, it is so important. And how did you get started on this journey? Well, you know, Joan, it actually it, it, it is a beautiful, beautiful place where science, uh, spirituality, indigenous wisdom, and human potential, where they all converge because they're all telling us something about ourselves that helps us to, to deal with the everyday world, that helps us to deal with what, what life brings to our doorstep. So, uh, you know, the, the question people ask me often is how I made what they perceive as a, a quantum leap from the, the corporate world where I was working as a, as a scientist and an engineer uh, into the, the kinds of things that we're talking about now. And I, I have to tell you, Joan, in all honesty, the first time I heard the question, I was surprised because for me it was less of a leap and more of a progression, more of a logical next step. Uh, I was working as a uh, solving crises uh, during the 1970s, the energy crisis, the, the first energy crisis, the 1970s. Uh, the Cold War crisis of the 1980s. Uh, I was a software developer, uh, developing uh, you know ways of gathering information. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, the communications crisis between different platforms, and, and I was the first technical operations manager with Cisco Systems. So each of those corporate careers uh, led me to understand people, how people think, uh, what people need to hear when new ideas are introduced. And for me, that beautifully laid the foundation for everything that we're doing right now, because we are now in a world in crisis. It's a crisis in consciousness, a crisis in thinking. So I'm still problem solving uh, during times of crisis. It's just on a much larger scale. And where we find ourselves, Joan, the new discoveries, science-based discoveries, peer-reviewed science is what we're going to talk about. So these aren't my hypotheses or, or my theories. I'm talking about rock-solid science that has overturned 150 years of scientific thinking when it comes to us and the way we think about ourselves, the way we solve our problems, the way we think about our relationship to the world, because our world is changing so, so very quickly in ways that we're not prepared for and we've, ways we've never seen. So we've got to think and live differently, and the new discoveries give us the reasons to do just that. Well, and I think, Greg, that's why I'm so drawn to your work, because I have an analytical type of mind. I like answers. I like science. So you mentioned that we're living in a chaotic world today, and, and I couldn't agree more. It, it just mm -hmm. seems like, I don't know, sometimes it seems like we've lost civility. People are attacking each other. They're so angry. What do you think is happening today? Well, I, I can address this. Uh, my, I'm a degreed earth scientist, a, a geologist, so my training uh, leads me to look at the big picture first, looking at, at cycles of time and, and systems of nature and the way they work together. So, you know, if, if we simply tune into the 6 o'clock news, it looks like the world's falling apart at the seams for, for no apparent reason. Uh, and it, it's very easy for us to, to fall into that. But if we step back, Joan, 
step back, look at the big picture. What we see is we're living a rare convergence of cycles uh, that we have never seen in 5,000 years of recorded human history. Uh, some of the cycles we're aware of, some of them were not. One of the cycles, climate, obviously uh, is very much in the public uh, conversation right now. And the fact, and it is a fact, that the climate is changing, the fact that the climate's changing in and of itself, if that's all that were happening, that would be enough to change the way we think and the way we live. It changes it changes when we grow our food, how we grow our food, how we share vital resources uh, of food, water, and, and medicine uh, between nations. So if that were all that was happening, that would be enough to change our world and throw us into chaos, but it's not. There is also an economic cycle that is ending. A 66-year-long cycle began in 1949. And if we're not aware of those cycles and the role that the cycles play in economies, and when I talk about economies, Joan, you know, economies can deal with money, but they do not have to. In my explorations of the world, I've been with many indigenous cultures. They have very healthy economies, but there's no money involved. So I'm not saying it's about the money. I'm saying it's about people. Economies are about people and the way we share the vital resources that we rely upon, that we need, uh, food, energy, you know, medicine, water, communications, defense, all those kinds of things. So we are living the close of a 66-year-long economic cycle. Uh, and in addition to all of those things, we are also living a very rare cycle of human conflict. And when I had the opportunity with uh, a dear friend and a colleague of mine, Dr. Bruce Lipton, mm -hmm. uh, we were invited to speak at the United Nations uh, not long ago, uh, giving our perspectives of what we see happening in the world, the cycles, the trends, uh, what can we expect in, in the near term? What can we expect in the long term? Uh, and Bruce is a life scientist, me as an earth scientist with a, a strong background in the life sciences. We, we told the story of converging cycles. And when we got to the cycle of, of conflict, it surprised many people in the audience. They had never heard of human conflict happening on a rhythmic or a cyclic basis. Uh, but the studies show very clearly the beginnings and the ends of the great wars uh, of the past, not just in the West, but in the world, they correlate very closely with other natural rhythms and cycles. Uh, magnetic cycles of the sun, for example, affecting magnetic fields of the earth, magnetic fields of the human heart, and social cohesion. So this is something we don't hear a lot about. The science is, uh, is pretty solid on this. And, and the bottom line is when the magnetic fields are weak, we become more aggressive, less willing to cooperate when the magnetic fields are strong, just the opposite occurs. And we are moving into a, a weakening period of magnetics that peaks in the year 2020. So when you put all of these together, uh, it tells us that we are living this very rare convergence of these cycles. But I, I want to be very clear, when we talk about the cycles of conflict, we're, we're not slaves to those cycles. They create vulnerabilities and susceptibilities, John, but the beauty of what we're talking about here is that they also create the greatest opportunities for peace and cooperation and harmony in society. Because when we understand our, the cycles and our relationship to those cycles, we begin to solve our problems in a much more conscious fashion. And if you look at the, uh, I've got these graphs and charts on the website and, and in the books, you can see that not only has conflict occurred uh, at the beginnings of these cycles and the ends, but also the greatest times of peace, the end of World War I, the end of World War II, for example, were both precisely uh, at the peak of, of these cycles. So the good news is that we are living a time, it is intense, but typically it's brief because these cycles don't last uh, on and on and on. Uh, and when we find ourselves in these cycles, they also present these great opportunities if we look into the past for innovation, for creativity, for peace, fashion, music, uh, art, uh, uh, finance, economies, all of these things have happened at the, at the tops and the bottoms of these cycles. So we're very near a peak in the cycle, the year 2020. Uh, and if it follows as we have in the past, it is a tremendous, a rare, precious, tremendous opportunity for some very, very good things that result from conscious choices. Greg, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, these are things that are not within our control. But then 
I was remembering something you told me the last time you were on the show, and it it has stuck with me all of these years, that post 9-11, there was such a unity in emotion, Mm -hmm. such a similar emotion around the world, that you had said it actually registered on the satellites uh, in outer space, the power of our emotion and our cohesiveness. So if we were to join together to unite and shift the way that most of us are feeling these days, would that have an impact on the cycle? Would it allow a lasting shift to take place? Well, that's a good question, Joan. I I believe we cannot necessarily control the natural rhythms and cycles. Uh, We definitely can determine how we respond to those cycles. And what we may find is when we begin to respond consciously, we actually influence the cycle itself. So for our our listeners that may not be familiar with uh, the study that, that you mentioned, what the, what the science very clearly showed, um, the magnetic field of the Earth uh, connects all life. Every form of life that we know of is, is not only connected, but it's influenced through the magnetic fields of, of the Earth. And because of that, the fields are tracked very closely by scientists. We have satellites that, that measure the fields, send those measurements back about every, every 30 minutes in the northern hemisphere. And it was those satellites that determined, uh, that actually measured within 15 minutes of the first plane hitting the first tower, the World Trade Center, the magnetic fields of the earth began to spike. And scientists believe that it was the combined output from human hearts. So the human heart is the strongest magnetic field generator in the body, the strongest biomagnetic field. It's about 5,000 times stronger than the brain. And they believe that hundreds of millions of people witnessing the tragedy of 9-11 on their televisions throughout the world. The satellites carried these images all over the world within about 15 minutes, that it was the heart-based outpouring of human emotion that actually coupled with the magnetic field of the planet that we live on, and it, it increased that field. And this goes back to what we were talking about a few moments ago. When the magnetic fields are high, we become more cooperative, less aggressive, and it appears for a few moments in time, we artificially increased that field. We actually influenced the magnetic fields of our planet. And we did it doing the things that our most ancient and cherished spiritual tr- traditions have always told us was, was the key to our survival. We did it not through our minds, um, but it was through our hearts. And there was a heart-based outpouring. Some of it was sadness. Some of it was anger. Uh, some of it was fear, but the key is it was all happening from the human heart. So the question is, can we positively impact that field without having a tragedy to give us a reason to do that? And the answer uh, is yes. And there is the first of its kind science-based project designed to do just that, the science-based initiative from the Institute of Heart Math, a uh, pioneering research organization in Northern California, designed to explore the the power of the human heart in unconventional ways. And what they have done is to create a project that's called the Global Coherence Initiative. We know that that personal coherence is good for our bodies. Global coherence is good for our planet. When we come together and we learn to harmonize our heart with the magnetic field of our planet through positive experiences, positive experiences of gratitude, appreciation, care, compassion, and do it in a very specific way, we find that we actually couple with this magnetic field. And there's an intentional effort to, to do that. Uh, right now, it's an ongoing effort. And it is a, a very innovative project, Joan. There, there are sensors that are placed on different continents of the Earth that feed back into the computers in Northern California so they can actually take the readings and, and there are people that are trained uh, to create this heart. It's called heart-brain coherence or heart-brain harmony. So it's harmonizing the two organs, master organs in the body, the heart and the brain, to create this, this life-affirming field. And the interesting thing to me, it's so fascinating, is that the techniques developed in the laboratory to influence these magnetic fields parallel the techniques that have been preserved in our most ancient uh, indigenous traditions and and cherished indigenous traditions. 
So this isn't about religion. It definitely is about spirituality uh, in terms of our relationship to our bodies and the earth. And it brings us full circle, Joan, because here we are, this rare and precious moment in the history of our planet, the convergence of these cycles, when we've got to think and live differently and solve our problems differently. And by following the wisdom of our past, it brings us full circle to influence the very fields that are causing the, the turmoil in, in the world today. So in a very real sense, we're talking about a, a powerful, internal, sophisticated technology that we're only beginning to understand. And it's a very, very different way of thinking, uh, certainly from when I was in school back in the in 1950s, 60s, and, and 70s. So Greg, understanding all of what you just explained, what can each one of us do to work together collectively for the better good? When we begin to understand the deepest truths of our existence, we are steeped in a story, Joan, of who we are, where we come from, and perhaps more importantly, what our capabilities or what we've been told our limitations are. We are steeped in the story of, of limitations. What we now know is that nature is not based upon survival of the strongest, that nature is actually based upon cooperation and what biologists call mutual aid. The more we understand, the better we know ourselves, Joan, the less we fear change in the world. The better we know ourselves, the less we fear other people. And we are being globalized. We're merging together cultures and religions and in the ways of thinking, the ways that men think about women and the way that women think about men. All of that is being merged in a way we've never seen, and we're being asked to embrace that, that merging through an obsolete belief and an obsolete way of thinking. It's simply not working. So as we allow ourselves to embrace what the best science of the 21st century is saying to us uh, and honor the science without the encumbrances of, of politics or corporations or you know, political agendas or religious agendas, if we let the science tell the story of who we are, it gives us the reasons to change the way we think about ourselves, and it gives us new ways to think and solve our, our problems. So I think the better we know ourselves, the less we fear one another, and, and perhaps most importantly, Joan, the better we know ourselves, the less we fear ourselves, the less we fear the potential, the extraordinary potential within each of us that we have been led to believe does not exist. And this is the potential uh, that I'm referring to when I talk about self-regulation. So we now know that we are wired, wired for self-regulation. We're the only form of life that can consciously strengthen our immune system on demand because we choose to do so, to, to awaken our longevity enzymes in every cell in our body to heal at the cellular level because we choose to do so. We're the only form of life that can create resilience to the change in the world around us when we choose to do that. We're the only form of life that can consciously create states of super learning, super memory, super cognition, and much, much more. And these are just examples of what the new discoveries are telling us when we embrace the science and let go of the old story of limitation. So I, I think when you ask, you know, what is it that can people do? My experience with groups, audiences throughout the world is when the facts are clear, our choices become obvious. When the facts are clear, we are generally a well-educated population. So we understand what our potential and what our capabilities are and our relationship to the earth and these cycles, then it makes sense. We, we know what to do, and that's when the choices become obvious, and that is very different than uh, being forced to make choices for no apparent reason, which is what a lot of what's happening now, and, it, and there's a lot of resistance to that. It doesn't work very well. It all comes back to what we know to be true about ourselves. It's about heart-based communication. It's about mindfulness in our everyday lives, a very popular word today. And it's about honoring our relationship to our bodies and to one another. And there, everyone learns differently, Joan. So there are so many different pathways to do precisely what we're talking about. But they are leading to the same goal. And the same goal, again, is the better we know ourselves, the better equipped we are to, to thrive, not just survive, but thrive in a really healthy way in this new world that's emerging. Greg, I've been doing this work now for almost a decade, and from the time when I began until now, I've seen a shift. I mean, I'm blessed to 
work with leaders in the world, no matter what their area of expertise. And and I have to agree with what you said. I, I'm finding that people are that that old you know survival of the fittest, eat or be eaten mentality. That's shifting away, and people are going more toward the mutually beneficial way of doing things, win-win situations, working together, collaborating. Sure. Sure. I've seen that shift, and and I hope that 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 actually goes out further into the world and that we continue doing it because it, it really is a better way to live, a better way to work, and it's a better way to exist with other people in this world. You know, Joan, for um, our listeners who are not blessed uh, to travel beyond the borders of this big, beautiful country that we live in, and this, this is an awesome country that we live in right now. Uh, but I do travel internationally uh, quite a bit. I've just come back from Eastern Europe. And the things that we're talking about now is different, uh, as different of a way of thinking as they are. And they're very different from what we have been taught in mainstream public education, very different from what our societies have, have led us to believe. What I want our, our listeners to know is that there is a tremendous openness and a willingness to embrace these ideas, in some cases, more so outside of the United States, even then inside the United States. The uh, U.S. Is, is going through a difficult time right now, a lot of self-examination, uh, introspection, uh, a lot of old ideas are being questioned, and, you know, this, this is all part of it. So this is where I think we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to ourselves to embrace what new discoveries are showing us, and we owe it to ourselves to draw from whatever source of information is truthful, factual, and honest, because we're living this, this rare convergence uh, that we, we don't have a guidebook. We don't have a manual telling us what to do right now. So I keep coming back. When we understand the deep truths of our existence, what we see is we are wired we're literally wired for times just like we're living now. We're, we're wired for resilience. We're wired for change. We're wired for rejuvenation, for regeneration. And when we begin to embrace these ideas uh, as well as accept that there is a new world that is emerging, then we begin to think more sustainably uh, on a, a global level. And personally, we become more resilient to what's happening in our families, what's happening in the workplaces, and what's happening within our own bodies. And it all comes back to this relationship that we have with, with the heart. So what we now know is, is the brain, we were taught, is the master organ in the body. We know how important the brain is, but now we know the heart is where the instructions come from, largely, that tell the brain what to do. So the heart is communicating with the brain to send the chemistry in the body, the healing chemistry or the stress chemistry. And the heart receives those instructions from our perceptions. How do we feel about the world? What, how, what is our sense of well-being? Uh, how do we feel about the changes in the world? And this is where the new discoveries are so powerful because we are self-referencing beings. The better we know ourselves, the less we hinge our well-being on our external world. So, uh, again, we're covering a lot of ground, but we're tying this all together because we, we live, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a big world, a lot of things happening. And, and the better we know ourselves, the better equipped we are to embrace all of that change in a really healthy way. So I, I think that's the key to everything we're saying here today, John. Today's guest has been Greg Braden. If you would like to get more information about Greg and his work, you can visit gregbraden.com. That's G-R-E-G-G, -G, gregbraden.com. Greg, thank you so much for coming back on the show and for sharing this really important information. As you said, the world is changing, but if we embrace the new discoveries, we can create exciting opportunities. So thank you for being here and for giving us hope. Uh, Joan, thank you so much for your program and for sharing this uh, information. It, it's, it's hard sometimes for people to know where to get this kind of information. So thank you for being a conduit of good news and, uh, and new discoveries. This is Conversations with Joan. Stay with us. We'll be right back.